I'm wearing my yellow t-shirt today, as you can all see, in honor of all technology journalists, because I suspect that our guest today, Mike Daisy, the distinguished monologuist and uh, author or star of The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, is going to say some things about the cowardliness of technology journalists. Mike, welcome to TechCrunch TV again. Great to see you. Good to, good to be here. Mike, I know you're not happy, to put it mildly, about technology journalists and their coverage, particularly of Apple. Would you like to say more about that? Well, I mean, the problem is that everyone should be unhappy with technology journalists. I think one of the things we forget about technology journalists is that they're journalists. Um, I think we often put the emphasis on the technology first, and that's sort of understandable. A lot of people come to technology journalism uh, through their love of technology, you know, and, uh, but fundamentally, without a vibrant, free press that is actually working hard to uncover stories, uh, you know, no field, no area can be healthy. And so uh, I'm upset, but I think uh, we all should be upset because the failure of technology journalism to act as journalists um, affects everything in the, in the tech industry, everything that we do. Well, that's a pretty big bomb, Mike, to throw. Can you be more exact? What are they failing to do, technology journalists? Well, specifically, you know, I uh, am performing this monologue you know, the agony and the ecstasy of Steve Jobs that we've talked about in the past, but it's, it's about the conditions in the special economic zone that exist in Shenzhen, China, and the conditions under which Apple and other electronics makers uh, manufacture our devices. And many people in technology don't like talking about this because it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant to discover that people are being exposed to nerve agents when they clean the screens of your iPhones and sustain permanent nerve damage. It's unpleasant to discover that people work 34-hour shifts and die on the line. All these things are very unpleasant to deal with because um, they necessitate a response. They demand a sort of response when basic human rights aren't respected. And the problem is that technology journalists live in this universe where because they need the devices from the corporations to review, the corporations have an incredibly effective technique for choking off dissent. In fact, they don't even have to choke it off. The dissent doesn't exist in the first place. They are utterly suborned. In fact, most technology journalists, I believe, don't actually see themselves as being truly separate from the companies that they cover. They do see themselves as arbiters, that there are a number of companies, and they see themselves as admiring one or another and trying to be impartial about judging their devices. But they don't actually see themselves as being representatives of a public good or of a cause larger than uh, any corporations at all. Um, and these kind of issues, like the environmental issues that are plaguing all of China, the labor issues that exist uh, about how these devices are made, these are the sort of overarching concerns that technology journalists should be sinking their teeth into. In fact, in a better world, these are fantastic stories. People should be, you know, uh, diving into them because they'll have a chance to really make a huge difference. Do you think that a certain kind of cowardly person is attracted to technology journalism? Or is it the, the process of technology journalism which is turning these journalists into cowards? I think, it's the, I think it's the process. Like anything where you interact with corporations a lot, you know, causes uh, an ongoing degree of, as you're engaged, you begin to make compromises, you know? And the entire process of working in, uh, in China is a process of compromise. You know, China is a fascist country run by thugs. And as a consequence, because we base a huge amount of manufacturing out of there, if you're covering that area, you begin to engage in a system of engagement with that government, with that system. You try to work within the system, and you become suborned. Um, uh, and I think uh, we can't dismiss the, a large part of this, is that I think a lot of people drawn to technology journalism. Technology was the love. Like, I don't know if a huge number of the journalists who are covering this um, have the journalistic chops 
frankly, to do real investigative journalism. If they are, we certainly don't see it very often. And I can see that in how my monologue's being covered. Um, there's ample coverage in the mainstream press. Uh, the mainstream press has actually uh, written a number of op-eds, pieces have been written about, about the piece engaging with the ideas and things going on in it. Other reporters have started to pick up the ball and uh, 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 call Apple and call other electronics makers and start to dig into some of the things that I brought up. Uh, but that's not coming from the tech journalists. In fact, I have trouble getting tech journalists into the room. There are a number of prominent tech journalists that still haven't even seen the monologue, despite the fact that it is running in their city. Would you extend your criticism also to coverage of uh, technology companies that are focused on software, companies like Facebook and Google? Because it's not only the hardware manufacturers who, uh, who, who, who can be criticized. Is that fair? I suppose. I mean, my, for, for the purposes of what I've been examining, you know, what I care about in large part are the labor issues and the environmental issues that exist. Uh, in how the devices are made. Um, my concerns mostly focus on the hardware. You know, uh, I think there are, are, are concerns that come out of software. And there are certainly concerns about how locked down and unfree uh, uh, software can be and, like, and like what our future looks like in terms of that. But to be truthful, the focus of my investigations in both the monologue and outside of it is just trying to get people to, to look at a really fundamental human story. I mean, we're talking about basic human rights. We're talking about people being worked to death, not as a metaphor, but literally dying in factories. And uh, the fact that we can't get even the journalists who represent technology to come as a group into the room and begin to really engage with that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying even that we can get them to disagree or agree. We can't even get them to start talking about it. Well, your show is currently on in New York, is that correct? Yes, it is. So we'll have to get our editor, Eric Schoenfeld, to come and see you. I don't know if he's been there yet. Have you, do you know Eric? I, I don't know Eric. Well, perhaps uh, you can give him a public invitation. And we'll oh, I'd be him. happy to. And, you know, and, uh, I mean, and some of them are really striking. I know that David Pogue hasn't been in to see the show. You know? And David Pogue, in my experience, would walk over broken glass on his hands and knees to see anything this is about Steve Jobs or the Mac or Apple. Um, and uh, the fact that he hasn't been in to see something that very publicly in his paper has been covered repeatedly, both the show, my own op-ed that ran in the Times op-ed section, talking about the issues that it raises is exactly the kind of thing he's supposed to be having his hands around. And the fact that I can't even get him in the room says something. I agree. What about Walt Mossberg? Because with Pogue, he's... He's the most uh, influential cheerleader within the media for Apple. Has he been to see your show? He did. He saw it in D.C., which, you know, I'll give him credit for. At the same time, we talked after the show, and I brought these issues up in the lobby. I talked to him about where the response was from technology journalists, the people who could be spearheading this kind of investigation, you know, uh, putting their, their boots on the ground. You know, a, a flight to Hong Kong. Uh, it's not that expensive, you know. I understand all our budgets are shrinking, but there is room when there's a major story to go and investigate it. And he didn't have even a remotely satisfactory answer. He 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 didn't know what to say, um, and I found that really disturbing. I was glad that he came, but it certainly hasn't changed or influenced any of his coverage since he saw the show. Uh, you would have no idea that he's actually been in to see the show. Mike, can I be really cynical for a moment? Sure. Um, well, even if you'd have said no, I would have said the same thing. <laughs> would it, do you think it might be fair to say that the problem, as much of the problem with technology journalists is with, of course, the journalists and their yellow, perhaps, kind of journalism, but it's also the yellow nature of the technology consumer. Because after all, if there was a huge appetite for these kinds of stories with perhaps the TechCrunch audience or the kind of people who read the the tech columns in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, and the journalists would be all over this. But consumers don't want to read bad news, particularly technology consumers. They only want to read about sexy new products. I don't know if that's fundamentally true. I think that that speaks a lot to how we shape the metaphor 
that we expect people to live inside of. You know, like we often, we very often say that we know, we in the media, people who, who tell stories, that we know what the public wants, what they want to hear. This is actually the same narrative that was used uh, uh, during abolition. This was the narrative that was used was that the public didn't want to talk about slavery. Uh, this was what was used during the civil rights movement was that, you know, people don't want to hear stories like this. It's even the story that's happening right now with Occupy Wall Street is that uh, there aren't that many protesters. Nobody actually cares. There's nothing to see here. Look away, look away, look away. Um, one of the ways the media represses stories is that you talk about a story this way. You say, um, not worth covering, not worth covering, not worth covering, not worth covering, been covered, been covered, been covered, been covered. You know, that's exactly what happened with the Wired magazine article, where Wired, you know, people are not always aware of this. I talk about it in the show because it was so shocking. Wired did a cover story on Foxconn and Shenzhen, and they sent a tech blogger who never done any investigative journalism before. They flew him to Foxconn in the company of Foxconn PR reps, walked him around some buildings, and he never spoke to a single worker. And then he filed a story about that that ran as the cover on Wired and told everyone that they could just go back to sleep. So I feel like it's a mutual system. You know, the public, the tech public, uh, wants to be coddled, wants uh, a sweet story filled with uh, reassurances that we're headed toward a bright utopian future where everything's going to be fantastic. At the same time, the media enables that story, you know. Um, uh, we can't actually learn how outraged uh, how much people could be pushed to action until they start hearing real news. And um, the fact that there isn't that much news to report in technology is part of what's so appalling. I read a lot of tech journalism. I mean, I read, I, I'm in it. I love all this stuff. I, and I mean, doesn't it strike anyone else how fundamentally boring most of it is? How it's the same stories over and over again and over? You would think there'd be this hunger to actually talk about Something, you know, there's, there's something interesting. <laughs> finally, finally. And uh, I bring this story and I'm like, I am a monologist. I am not a journalist. I went there, I saw these things. Go and do likewise. Fly to Hong Kong, get your visa, take the subway to Shenzhen, which you can do from Hong Kong. Get out of the subway, go to the gates of the factories and start talking to people. And um, I swear to God, it feels like I'm gonna eventually have to fly them myself in a plane over there. Uh, before they'll do anything. And I'm convinced at this point that mainstream reporters who do other kinds of reporting will tell this story before anyone in the tech press actually gets off their ass and starts. And I, I think that's a disgrace. Well, I think that that's a great challenge, Mike. I think I'm happy to make it. I'm mean, really like, uh, and if there anyone out there, you know, we, we run in New York for three more weeks, any tech journalist, I don't care how big or small your credentials are. Email me. My name is my website. There's an email link. It comes to me. I will set you up with tickets. Absolutely. I'm on the plane, Mike. And thank oh, you. Oh, good. We'd love to have you. Eve, and, I, and I'll change my T-shirt. Good. Mike Daisy, as always, a pleasure and an honor. And best of luck with the agony and ecstasy, which is still playing in New York City. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.